And so today I'm going to deal with jealousy because we're often triggered, you know, we're triggered by cer certain things trigger us, whatever it is, a comment on Facebook, something you see on TV, something someone says to you, and it, and it triggers a response. And what we want to do is we want the responses to be biblical and godly, right? We don't want to be mired up in uh, a bondage and things like that. So last week we talked about living above offense, and this week I'm talking about living free from jealousy. Yes. Amen. Living free. You can be free of it. Amen. You can, I have good news. This is the good news. This is the gospel. You can be free of it. Book of 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. So David, well, let me just drop down to verse let me drop down to verse 7 and read this. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And verse 8, Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. So what's happening here? is that in the story of David and Saul, Saul being the first king of Israel, God had chosen this guy. He was the, he was the one that Samuel had anointed to be king, and he did great for a, for a season. But then he, his life started falling apart, and he started disobeying the Lord. And it got so serious that God took the kingdom from him. God raised up the young boy David, the youngest of his family, a boy who was a sheep herder, God raised him up, and Samuel the prophet anointed him to be the next king of Israel. And if you read that transition in the book of 1 Samuel, it's, it's interesting because in one pivot, the Spirit of the Lord comes on David, and the Spirit of the Lord lifts off Saul. The Spirit of the Lord comes on David. He will be the next king, and then it lifts off Saul. And then from that moment on, we see David appear. David defeats Goliath in the battle and then after that, Saul puts him as the head of his armies. And as the head of his armies, he obviously goes out and does great exploits. And then as they're marching through the streets, all the ladies come out and they say, Saul, he's okay. He's killed thousands, but David has killed ten thousands. And Saul had a choice, even though the spirit had left him. Even though the kingdom was taken from him, Saul still had a choice that day, I think, to bless David. But he chose not to. He could have said, this is my protege. This is the young man that's going to take the kingdom. And this man will do greater things than I have ever done. My ceiling's going to be his floor. And I'm going to, turn the, I'm going to pass the baton to him and he'll be great. But he didn't do that. Instead, he got jealous. He got jealous and he got angry. And from that moment on, he pursued and, and ran after David trying to take his life from him. Why? Because jealousy will do that. Jealousy destroys relationships. Jealousy destroys marriages. It can. Jealousy can destroy families. Jealousy can destroy churches. Jealousy can destroy your life. James Dobson said jealousy is like termites in a house. They come and they're eating away at the foundation and just eating you up and eating you up. So we're going to get some pest control today. And we're going to take, kill these things out. Amen? It's not going to take our life and rob our joy. And, and jealousy robs your joy. You can't be happy because you're thinking about that. It's in you. That jealous thing is working in you. Spirit of jealousy. But as God's people, we need to rise above this. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. The Bible says, however, let me just start out with this, and y'all just track with me today, because the Bible says, and it's interesting, that God is jealous. That there is a godly jealousy. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 24 that Joshua was really rebuking the people, and he said, you cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. Then in the book of Exodus chapter 34, you have to think about it as the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land and God was preparing them for that. God said in verse 13, He said, But you shall destroy their altars and break their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So God was so jealous his name was jealous. 
And when we see a name of God like that, we know it is a characteristic of God, like Jehovah Jireh, He is the God who provides, or Jehovah Shammah, He is the God who is always there, or Jehovah Sidkenu, He's the God of righteousness. Well, He's a God whose name is Jealous. But with God, His jealousy is perfect and holy. There's no sin in it. There's no unrighteousness in it. So what does that look like? To God, for God, jealousy means he, is, he wants to protect the covenant relationship He has with people. He wants to protect the covenant relationship He has with us. So God wants us to Himself. This is all through the Bible. It's so beautiful that, that as you read through the wisdom literature, you know, uh, uh, recently I taught through the book of the Song of Solomon on Wednesday nights online, and, and I, I saw this unfolding as we walked through that book and began progressing through it, that it's the story of a, of a young woman and a young man who are going to get married, and I think there is a marriage chapter that happens in that book, actually. But it's about their love for one another. And it's about their passion for one another. And the book gets like steamy. It like te- but not like modern junk. It takes you to the brink and leaves the, less, the rest for imagination. But anyhow, you see by the end that they're not satisfied until they have each other. Why? Because love leads to possession. Love leads to possession of the beloved thing. And that's what, and it represents the, rep, the, the, the relationship between Christ and His church. He wants all of us. And we should want all of Him. He wants all of us and we should want all of Him. We want full possession. That's what we want. We want to be the, the bride walking in and the bridegroom is there. We did this beautiful wedding yesterday. And uh, I got front, I, got the, I get the best position in the house. I get front and center. And I walk down the aisle and here, here, comes, uh, here comes the bride. And I'm standing with the groom. And he's choked up. And he's turned around. He said, just tell me when I can turn around. I said, okay. <laughs> and he turned around. And then tears are flowing. And she's walking in. And. I'm thinking of other things so I don't get choked up and cry because I'm trying to make it through this. Just beautiful. Amen? That's, that's the moment where they say, I'm yours forever and you're mine forever. Come on, some married people should be amen in me right now and giving me some love in here. That's the moment when it's like, I'm yours forever Your mind forever. That's what God wants. And in that sense, He's jealous of us. He doesn't want us to to give our lives to Him and then spend the rest of our lives. Messing around. You don't want to get married and then have to deal with unfaithfulness in your marriage. You don't want to do that. That would be the worst nightmare ever to think, well, I'm going to marry you, but I know you're going to be unfaithful. There's a metaphor. Think about the book of Hosea, talking about metaphors. God tells Hosea, who is a prophet, go marry a prostitute. But he had her do that because he was using it as an example to show Israel how unfaithful they had been and how jealous he was. And then what did, what, what, did, what did he have to do? He had to go forgive her and bring her back to show how much God loves us that even though we've been unfaithful, he still comes after us and brings us back. He's that jealous. Man, I could preach on this all night long. I just love this story. God loves us with a righteous jealousy. It's one of his, it's one of his divine attributes. But for us... I think there is a righteous jealousy you could have over the right things or even over your spouse. There's a righteous jealousy you can have. But unfortunately, most of us in human flesh, when we deal with jealousy, we deal with it in an unrighteous manner or it comes as a sinful thing into our lives. It comes kind of, it comes as envy. 
Envy is when you want something that someone else has. You want that. That's what the Ten Commandments calls coveting. And it's a sin. To want what somebody, the desire to gain something that you don't have that belongs to someone else. And so the majority of the time, I think we're wrestling with an unhealthy jealousy. And it can, it, if it triggers in you, it can eat the foundation of your life. So we're going to throw it out today. Come on, somebody just do this. I'm, I'm throwing it behind. We'll give you three ways to do it, all right? But there's more, but these are my kindergarten elementary level three ways. Because I'm not preaching to drafts, I'm preaching to sheep. So we're not way up here, we're going to get down here, amen? Number one, number one way to get rid of jealousy is simply focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. James said, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So we don't want confusion and every e evil thing. We want to clear the table and we want to make Jesus the centerpiece of our lives. Let Him be everything. If you found Jesus, you found the treasure hidden in a field. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That a man went out and he discovered it and he sold everything just to buy that field. He said the kingdom of heaven is like the pearl of great price that a pearl dealer uh, who dealt in pearls, he found this one pearl and he sold everything he had just to get that one thing. That's what Jesus is to us. We sacrifice, we give up everything because he's so amazing. And I tell you, if he's no longer that to you, then you've got a problem. If he no longer satisfies you, then you have a big issue. If Jesus is not enough for you, then you'll try to fill your life with everything else to satisfy what only He can satisfy in your life. And I've noticed the principle that, that when, I, when I meet with people who are sold out to Jesus, and as I was preparing this, I thought about some missionaries that I've known through the years who've been my heroes. And when I've, I've been around them, I didn't hear them talking about things other people had. I didn't hear them complaining over how much they wish they had a brand new car or a new house or they wish they looked like this person or they could do... I, I don't really hear that from those people sold out to Jesus. All I hear is them overflowing with how good God is and what He's allowed me to do and God's opened so many doors. And Several years ago, I was invited to a missions uh, dinner in Oklahoma City and I went there and I, I, I sat down next to a couple who worked in India for over 60 years for the Pentecostal Holiness Movement. And I was just like, I was honored to sit next to them. And the brother now, way up in age, sat next to me and it's like he, he was like kind of holding on to me the whole time telling me about God and how great India was. And that man wore me out. In, a great, in the greatest of ways. I was broken, man. I was like, God, this man is so far beyond me, Lord, in, in the things of the Spirit. And I was just like, I was so humbled with what that guy had, 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 had shared with me. That's somebody sold out for Jesus. He wasn't sitting there complaining about his struggles in America. Because really, I know, you know, wealth is, is relative in a way, but let's look at it, it, let's look at it in an in in overarching way, folks. You and I living in America are wealthy compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world has maybe a dollar or two to live on per day, and here we are, we're complaining if the AC goes out. Or if my cruise control messed up on my car. And I, I have an image in my mind that, that I don't ever want to leave. And a few years ago, I saw this picture on, on social media of, of, a, of a church in the Philippines. And there was a church in the Philippines that had been flooded. And the congregation was standing there in knee-deep water, worshiping the Lord. And I thought about it. How determined, you know, how would that affect us? I mean, I shortened the service to 58 minutes a couple Sundays ago, and everybody's complaining about how hot it was downtown. <laughs> and it was hot, but you know what? How, thank God we had 
an air-conditioned car to hop back into. Amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I was in Africa a few years ago under a mango tree, and this guy had begun his church under a mango tree. In hot, I mean hot West Africa. Hallelujah. I'm just beating you up a little bit now, but I'm going to get you out of a hole, okay? How about let's focus on Jesus? How about let's focus on Jesus and be thankful? Hallelujah. How about let's make Him the main thing? And if He becomes the main thing, everything else kind of melts away. When He becomes the main thing, all those addictions you can just walk right out of. When He becomes the main thing, all of those previous sins and snares that were holding you back before just seem to melt away from your life. When He's the main thing, you're like a moth drawn to the flame. And the closer you get to the flame, the more you die to eventually you're just stuck to the life like bug zapper you're just you know it's all about him now and not you how many would raise your hand and say I want to fall in love more with Jesus second way you can walk out of this is you must stop comparing yourself with other people stop comparing yourself with other people Because comparisons can destroy you. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, he said, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. He said, We, however, will not boast beyond measure. Will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. So Paul is saying, I'm, I, I'm not concerned with these other guys. And I'm not coming in trying to compare myself with them. I'm dealing with you guys and the sphere of influence God has given me. And I'm dealing with the calling that I have on my life. And you think about it. He said, I've counted everything lost that I might gain the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I've counted all of my accolades, all of my accomplishments, all of my ethnic heritage as a Jew, all of my education at the feet of Gamaliel, my status as a Pharisee who were very respected in the local Palestinian villages. I'm counting all of that as loss that I might find Him and know Him in the power of His resurrection and in the fellowship of His sufferings. Forget about comparing. We can learn from others. We can mentor from others. You want to do that. But when jealousy gets taken out of it, you can learn freely. You can, be a, you can mentor freely under someone. But when jealousy is involved, you're constantly comparing yourself with someone else. They have a two-door garage. You're going to build a three-door garage. They have one c do You're getting two c dos They have a new Cadillac. You're going to get a new Lexus. They have a 40-inch TV. You're getting a 52-inch TV. Ain't nobody helping me in this house this morning. How do you break that, how do you break that comparison thing? Turn it, turn it into compliments. Because compliments destroy comparisons. Come on. Compliments destroy comparisons. I've just kind of made it a discipline in my life and I've noticed it sets me free. When I see somebody get something, a brand new vehicle, I shout with them. I had someone recently show me a brand new, like, they, they, I think it was a brand new uh, Suburban or something they got. And I'm like, gee, I could have been like, oh, I'd like to have a Suburban. <laughs> Lord, what's up? What's the deal? Where's my Suburban? I, but I didn't do that. I went out and I said, "Woo, man, this thing's nice. Let me look at this thing. Man, you are blessed and I'm blessed to be. If God's in the neighborhood blessing, I might be next. I'm going to get next to you. Not be jealous of you, you know. If he's blessing and he's in the neighborhood, I want to be around. Amen? And I don't want to be shutting off the blessing through my jealousy. I want to be happy and shouting for you. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. A friend of mine called me recently and said, I just got a brand new house, Hans, and he told me the size of it, and I'm not even going to say it because it's mind-blowing. And you know what I said? Hallelujah, man. How, you know how to handle it because God's given it to you, and you know how to walk in it and rejoice in it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Be blessed. 
He said, I want to have you over sometime. I'm like, would love that. <laughs> would love that. I would love that. And just rejoice. Come on, somebody. When you get that attitude, it destroys jealousy. It destroys jealousy in your life. It can just break it right down. And you know, Paul, I talked this two weeks ago. Paul uses the term in him 164 times in his writings. So what he's saying is, I think our focus should be on who we are in Him. In Christ. Because if I know who I am in Christ, then I don't have to be grabbing for other stuff to try to make me somebody. Because some people only live to get other things thinking it will make them somebody they're really not. And often it leads us to put down other people. If we see someone doing good, the flesh rises it up and wants, well, somebody did that for them. I mean, I've caught myself backing up and couching this thing. It's like, uh, well, you, you know how they got that, don't you? And what we want to do is we want to push them down a little bit because we think it's going to elevate us a little bit. But in reality, it just pushes us down to their level. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen right now. I'm preaching on Hans right now. Come on, but how about just go ahead and let it be what it is. Compliment, thank Jesus for them. Thank God for what He's doing in their lives because you're next, hallelujah. And God's going to come and do great things in your life. And when God does elevate you and do great, does great things in your life, you don't want somebody else putting you down. You want somebody to shout with you and rejoice with you, so do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So just go ahead and rejoice. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. If my friend gets a brand new Harley Davidson, I want to shout for him. Maybe he'll let me sit on it. Because if I sit on it, maybe the Lord will say, this is you next, Hans. Somebody shout hallelujah. Paul said, we are his workmanship. Come on, we are his workmanship. We need to be thankful. God's going to bless us according to the gifts and the calling and the destiny he has on our lives. And trying to be somebody else is a useless pursuit. I mean, you can mentor and admire qualities in people and learn that way, but you can do it without jealousy and trying to be that person. Third thing you need to somehow develop an attitude of gratefulness in your life. Develop an attitude of gratefulness in your life. Because when you're grateful for things, it breaks that, that gnawing, jealous thing in you. Notice the Bible says, Proverbs 17, 1, Better is a dry morsel, a dried out old piece of bread. Let me take it further. Better is the molded end, the heel of the loaf that's been sitting out for two months on your counter than a house full of feasting with strife. He said it's better to have an old piece of dry bread than to have a smorgasbord where everybody's ticked off and mad and competing with one another. So sometimes if you're just pursuing things and you don't have that attitude of gratitude, and you're doing it out of jealousy, things aren't going to make you happy. How many have known some absolutely miserable rich people? And I have nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing, God gives it to you, but do it with gladness. Do it without jealousy. Do it without that competitiveness. Do it with a heart of thanksgiving. Do it as you give out of the overflow that God's blessed you with, and then you're really going to walk with happiness. Can somebody shout amen? Psalm 95, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord and let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. We should come with an attitude of thanksgiving. And when we have that attitude, it can break that spirit of jealousy off of our lives. Lord, I'm thankful this morning that I'm worshiping in a church that's having computer problems, but we're still worshiping You. I'm thankful this morning that my mic's gone out twice and something's wrong with it, but thank God Garner had a mic that he let me preach with. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. 
I'm thankful that it's, that it's getting hot outside, but we have several air conditioners in this building that make it comfortable for us. I'm thankful that I was able to drive a vehicle to church this morning and didn't have to hitchhike or walk. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for everything God has blessed me with. I'm thankful to live in a country where I can still worship freely according to the laws of our nation. I can still preach what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Without being arrested. Hallelujah. And I give God praise for that. Can somebody shout amen? I'm thankful that I'm saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and on my way to heaven and waiting the return of the Lord. I'm thankful that God has given me joy that the world couldn't give me. I'm thankful God has given me peace that the world couldn't give me. I'm thankful for a cross 2,000 years ago standing outside of the city gates where a man named Jesus carried his cross to that place. Crown of thorn on his head. took the nails for me and you. Was crucified there. Gave up the ghost and said Father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Hallelujah. And he gave his life for me and you and that's the only reason why we're standing here today. I'm thankful for that day. How many can give me a wave out there? I'm thankful for an empty tomb on the third day. Hallelujah. That on the third day, Mary and Martha went down there and the angels were saying, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Hallelujah. Go tell the others what you've seen. I'm thankful for the day of Pentecost. I'm thankful for an upper room. I'm thankful for 120 praying and praying through till the Spirit of the Lord came like a rushing mighty wind. Hallelujah. And clothed and tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. They began praising God and speaking with tongues and went out and won the world to Jesus. I'm thankful to be in the body of Christ. I'm thankful no longer to be in the world but to be in the sanctified church. He said there is a church. We've come to Mount Zion. Hallelujah. It's the church of the firstborn. We're the church of the firstborn brethren. We're on our way. We're that great throng, that great number that John saw in Revelation who had washed their robes white with the blood of the Lamb praising Him forever and ever singing praise be unto the One who was and is and is to come. Come on, are you thankful this morning come on if you're thankful make some noise and give him all the praise let's do his name oh hallelujah hallelujah enter his gates with enter his gates with and his courts with why not enter into church and not be like gosh I hope Hans gets done quickly I'm so hungry, I'm starved, my stomach's eating, my backbone slamming too. Or how, how about not coming to church and worried about, wonder what they're thinking about me. Think I'm dressed okay, my hair look all right. I don't want to worship too, I'm going to keep it low key back here in the back. How about just, how about just walking in saying, Lord, you give, you've given me another day. You've given me another week to praise you. Lord, I'm going to thank you today for all that you've done the past seven days. God, I'm going to give you praise. If no one else praises him, I'm going to be guilty. I'm going to be the one that gives him some praise. Oh, hallelujah. If no one else shouts hallelujah, I'm shouting hallelujah. If no one else raises their hand, I'll be the only one, Lord. I'm going to be the one that stands and give you glory. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Some of us shouldn't be here. Some of us should be dead and gone. Some of us should have been taken out long ago, but the Lord had mercy and the Lord protected us. I don't know about you, but I feel like shouting right now. Hallelujah. I feel like giving him a praise. I feel like giving him all the praise through his name. Let everything that has breath praise you, the Lord. Come on. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Thank you so much for listening today, watching with us, opening your heart to the Word of God. It's my highest honor to preach the Word. Our church exists to reach people like you. That's why we exist, to be able to communicate the gospel to the entire world. God has given us such an amazing outreach here to be able to do it this way through the internet and stuff. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. So I pray that God has touched you today that God has ministered to you, and I want to pray for you right now. If you need to accept the Lord into your heart, give your life to Jesus, or if you need healing in your body or healing in your mind, I want to pray for you right now. 
Could you join with me? Come on, just make this declaration. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. I repent of all sin and I commit my life to you right now in Jesus' name. Come on, if you need healing, stretch out your hand. Father, for those who need a healing touch, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you heal them body and mind and touch them right now. We rebuke the disease and sickness that it's afflicting their body, and I pray for a complete wholeness. Come over them in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him praise right where you are. Thank God for everything he's done in your life. Tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. We love you guys, and it's a privilege to come to you.